driving forces for the erosion. Um, Dr. Kareni is the uh, hydraulics research engineer uh, at the Federal Highways Office of Infrastructure Research and Development. Uh, he coordinates hydraulic and hydrologic research activities with state and local agencies, academia, and various partners and customers. He also manages Turner Fairbanks, um, the Sterling Jones Hydraulic Research Center. Um, and co-presenting with uh, Dr. Kareni is James uh, Pagenkopf. Uh, he's also a research engineer at Federal Highways Office of Infrastructure, providing support for hydraulic and hydrological research activities at Turner Fairbanks as well. He was previously a research engineer providing over 12 years of contracting support at Turner Fairbanks um, for both the hydraulics and aerodynamic uh, laboratories. So with that, please welcome Cornell and James. Um, well, thank you. Um, first, I'm really happy to say I don't have to share my screen. Can you see my screen? <laughs> All right. So. Um, yeah, before I start, I just want to add a little bit what Daniel said on, on, on NextCower is, um, as Daniel mentioned, it's really the marriage, and we are married now, right, between geotech and hydraulics, um, uh, looking at SCAR from different standpoint, from the erosion resistance with the geotechs help us, but also from the loads uh, in terms of shear stresses. That's one part. Another part is... Um, we talked about lots of uncertainties to look at scale from a probabilistic standpoint. And finally, the scale depth is a random variable. That's what we want to kind of show here. And, and the third part, Hubert Lay from Argon is going to talk about that tomorrow is about CFD scale, that there will be a session tomorrow morning, and Hubert will talk about that. Um, so for today, we'll talk, talk about the... Uh, uh, Transportation Pool Fund um, study, um, 461, that's a, a services which we uh, try to provide to the states. If any states has a, an important design, um, we want to help out with that next car initiative. And please, at this point, it's just research. It's not implemented at this point, it's a research initiative. Um, the next car research was actually kicked off Hold on, let me just go, okay, where's the pointer here? Um, was kicked off with um, our in situ scout testing device, which we started developing in, in 2012. And um, over the years, we, provide, uh, we got some funding to kind of test that in situ device, because that was kind of the idea of the, to get more information on the erosion resistance. Um, we actually visited all these um, states, um, which are highlighted in green, to kind of refine that system. And then um, we had, after, after it took us about two years, till about um, uh, 2019, uh, actually 2020, till we had actually a good device out there because that really helped us to kind of improve the, the system. And then uh, in the next step, we established that pool fund study. Um, and you can see the highlighted states here in pink. Uh, these are all the states who are part of, the, of that pool fund and or considering to be part of the pool fund. Um, and today we're going to focus on a project we conducted for MDOT Michigan. Um, uh, but before that, I just want to quickly explain what that pool fund service provides. Um, we can um, actually um, take Shelby tubes or Shelby tubes can be shipped to the Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center and either we, the geotech lab can do an EFA test or we can do an ESTD test. Another task is to go to the DOT and do an in situ testing. Um, and also once the, uh, the Shelby tubes are shipped to us, we can do a geotechnical assessment of the materials. And uh, for instance, Illinois DOT actually asks us to fabricate uh, in situ device. So they are using it as we speak in the field and doing testing, um, but then, also support, so that to, uh, pool fund is actually more. We do CFD modeling, we also do physical modeling, which we did for MDOT, and we'll explain in a second. And uh, it's a nice collaboration and, and really helps us, and I thank all the states um, contributing to really um, test that next scale research. Um, currently, we are involved in these projects, actually finished um, Arizona. We are um, finalizing the report. We also finished Michigan. Um, and we are working on North, uh, uh, a bridge in North Carolina and in Pennsylvania. It's actually something unique. We are looking at a culvert outlet. It's not actually a typical bridge scour. 
and uh, in bridging Colorado, we also actually completed. So um, the first part is to develop a, uh, uh, the load, kind of a decay function, um, which means that um, if once Skala forms, um, the, the driving forces of the Skala actually taper off because the cross-section opens and the velocity slows down and the whole vortex actually expands. So you have less acti erosion activity once you have kind of an equilibrium scala depth. So the forces, the shear forces decay as the scala deepens. And how we research or how we actually develop that decay for curve is through experiments. So we do a physical modeling and then we, what we do, we scan incremental scala depth in that physical model with a laser scanner. So we have incremental scala bathymetries, which I'm gonna show in a second here. These are all scans out of the physical experiment, and then we run CFD modeling on these all incremental scans, which you can see here. And um, with the CFD, we can actually then um, um, determine the boundary shear stresses for every incremental depth, and that gives us the shear decay curve on the loading side. Um, now, on the resistance side, um, and that actually gives us kind of like a, a, a decay function. This is a custom decay, decay function for the, because the, uh, the uh, bridge we investigated for MDOT was a very com a complex and a unique structure. That was, this is actually a, a customized decay function. We're also working on a more generalized for, for different pier shapes, but this was, was for that uh, buckle span uh, bridge pier which we looked at. So you can see the best fit line and also the, uh, the design line which kind of envelops the data with a certain reliability. Um, I think James, you're next to talk about the um, resistance. All right, thanks Cornell. Uh, hi, I'm James. I'm gonna be discussing um, the erosion resistance side as we discussed, the two sides. Uh, and this is, I'm gonna be discussing the soil erosion testing we conducted here for MDOT. Um, so they shipped us, we looked at, um, so like Daniel said, we worked with, uh, we worked with the Michigan uh, Geotechs. We, they provided this, uh, this is a, a subsurface soil profile here, and you can see there's this layer of soil, uh, loose sand, silty sand, and, but we were concerned here with this medium to lean uh, medium to hard lean clay. And this starts at about 30 feet to, it's, it, we, we, we gave it about an average about 530 feet, that's the elevation here. But there's about a 10 to 15 foot layer of, of sand here. They collected 27 Shelby tubes and they're from three boreholes. We have two boreholes at the pier and we have one borehole here at the uh, left abutment. And they, sh they took some from the upper layers, but we were mostly concerned with the lower layers. This is, we really wanted to get the critical shear stress of this uh, lower uh, layer of clay. So you can see here we tested nine samples. Eight were from the lower layer, and then one was sort of up here higher. This was ST5. Click ahead. So here's our, uh, this is our erosion ex situ scour testing device. This is one that we do in the lab. So if you were at 2018 NHEC, we actually did a field demonstration of the in-situ scour testing device, and Cornell mentioned that earlier. That is with an erosion head. It's located inside the Shelby tube. Uh, the drill rig drills down to the layer we want to test, and we pump water down there, and we road the sample. But during the pandemic, we weren't traveling as much, but uh, states were able to ship the samples to us in barrels. Uh, we would take one-foot samples, and we would place them in our lab device, it's the SCD. So we have, this is our lab robot mounting a Shelby tube in the device, and this is the laser scanner. It conducts a scan on the soil surface about every uh, 20 seconds or so. There's a flow going through there right now. You can see sort of, if you can see the lasers moving across it. On the right hand side here, this is a sample of the data that we can collect here, uh, scanning the soil surface. And what we do is we increase this next slide here. This shows you the typical data that we collect from one of our tests. Uh, we have increasing flow rates here. And so it starts at about two liters a second, then we go to three, four and a half, uh, six. Uh, this, each test, each flow rate is about 10 minutes. And then you can see here the soil, this is the erosion. It, uh, it jumps here a little bit, 
and then jumps again and, and continues to go down. Uh, this looks like big jumps, but this is only about two centimeters in about a half hour of testing. And then we tested, we only got through nine, nine Shelby tube samples from this site. They sent us all those samples, but the problem is erosion testing is very slow. So, and you're sort of limited by how fast the device goes. You can see most of the data is clumped together, which is nice, but right here you can see this is uh, Shelby tube five in that upper layer. Definitely have higher erosion rates at uh, lower flow rates. And actually in this, in this plot here, we have converted the flow rates already to shear stress. If you remember back at the video, there were two soil samples on the surface. The one on the right was a shear sensor. We can measure shear directly, and so we will do a separate set of tests where we can uh, calibrate the flow rate with the shear stress. But the problem is here is you, when we were trying to, what we want to do is get a critical shear stress from this data. But it's, it's difficult to sort of run through this. It's sort of scattered. There's a lot of scatter. When we originally conducted the test, we figured that every flow rate, we'd have one data point with an erosion rate, and we could just fit a power curve through it. But soil, is, it's natural. Uh, it's not man-made. There's lots of uncertainty there. So it never worked out perfectly. So we had to develop another way to analyze the data, one that incorporated a little bit of pro probabilistic analysis. So we decided instead of doing uh, just a, a nonlinear power fit curve to get that critical shear, we would run, we would do, take the natural log from both sides and we would run a linear regression through it. So you can see that we have, uh, we have two variables here to fit it. And then in, if you look at EFA uh, testing, which is something the geotechs have developed, it's a very similar device to the ESCD, but it's not automated like we've developed. They've set off this critical shear cutoff at 0.1 millimeters an hour. So that's something that's, if that's in literature, that's what we based our, uh, our cutoff on. And so you can see here, this is our, all that data, but we've also split the data up. Instead of running just a mean uh, linear regression through that, through each, uh, each flow rate lasts about 10 minutes, like I said before, instead of running one best fit through it, we would split it up into, into smaller windows. And then you could remember that it sort of dropped off quickly and then it sort of slowed. This allowed us to capture that, that range of erosion. So when we, when we split it up in the four minute windows, we ended up with 1,127 data points. We set a minimum cutoff and this is based on the resolution of that laser scanner. We, can't, we, we told ourselves we can't measure any finer resistance or any finer variability in the soil than what the laser could capture. And then these, uh, this is the minimum flow rate we ran, and then the, the data sort of increased here. And you can sort of see in the log, natural log uh, plot, you can see there's, there is sort of a cloud of data here that shows that curve. So we ran a best fit curve through here. That intersect, uh, that intersect here, oh, hold on. Uh, sorry, I thought <laughs> it's, it's coming up later. Uh, the intersect here, it, where it crosses here, is this is when you do the reverse, uh, reverse of the uh, linear fit, then you get the 20.5 Pascal. So it worked out, this gave us a reasonable uh, data point here. But then we wanted to look at this more in a probabilistic way. How can, we, how can we take this data and sort of do a, see the range of the data points? And we first tried a bin method where we split the data into horizontal bins and then we would take the mean of each bin and run a fit through that. But it wasn't, it wasn't producing the best data. So we, we were talking with other people at Turner Fairbank and they recommended that we try this bootstrapping method. And for this bootstrapping method, it's a statistical technique and it will give us not only the mean, but this gives us a standard deviation, a coefficient of variance and a confidence interval. And what we do is we take those thousand data points and we split them up and we look at 40 at a time and we do this randomly we pull 40 out, we run a fit through it, then we throw them back in the, in the bucket, we do it again 50,000 times, and then we look at how that, how that uh, changes. And so I think this video is about to play, there it goes. So you can see now we're taking a sample from each and then we're running a linear fit through it. And then as we start to speed it up, we start to get a distribution of linear fits here.
Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now here you see, now we have the linear fit that goes through the data. We have a 95% confidence interval in the mean. And this is what I was waiting for before I got lost on the slide. So now when we run this uh, 0.1 millimeter an hour fit through here, now we get this cross-sectional here. Now we have a distribution of that critical shear stress. And we were very pleased to see that once again the mean was there at 20.5 Pascal. And then you can get a standard deviation, which was for this, uh, it was about six or seven Pascal. The, the, we ended up saying that the design critical shear would be one, the mean versus one standard deviation. So that ended up being 13.9. So this will fit back into what Cornell will talk about later about how we can do a probabilistic analysis for this uh, data set. And I think now we go to bootstrapping okay. for the decay function. Um, so um, thank you, James. Um, but we also use this. Um, for the deterministic analysis because we can, as James mentioned, once we have the COE, we can actually lower the critical shield by one standard deviation to make it more conservative. Something similar we did for the decay functions I mentioned earlier. We also did a bootstrapping, you can see here. And then, um, uh, as you can see, there are two coefficients, the A and B, and so we could get a distribution for A and B, which um, will be very helpful then once we do a once we determine the equation uncertainty of that um, decay function in the probabilistic analysis. Now, um, what does this uh, reveal now for the um, m.scal dot scale depth? Um, first, you can see these are kind of the, uh, the mean. So this is still not the, not the design, um, except as you can see on the shear stress here at the bottom. So this was kind of the mean, but it's actually lowered by that one standard deviation. So the critical shear design was 13.9 Pascal, and as may, the, um, James mentioned, we assume the clay is starting at elevation um, 530, and the loads were increased um, to make it even also, to um, uh, make it more conservative. And as you can see, the Q100 and both the Q500 are actually less at the 530 elevation. We have 9.3 versus 13 Pascal, and they are actually lower than the um, uh, design critical shear. So that gave us some confidence that kind of the scour would stop and the clay will hold up the, the scour at that elevation. Now, um, that's nice, but how does this now relate to um, exceedance probabilities? And that's in the next couple of slides. Um, I still have five minutes to kind of to explain that to you. Hopefully it's not too complicated. Um, but you should be a familiar with random real, but we use it every day. If you use a Q500 and a Q100, you are using a random, a random variable, believe it or not, but you just drop the ball and run deterministic. It's actually, you're using random variables already. Um, so what, what, what are the uncertainties we are uh, looking at here? So first of all, there are natural uncertainties. Um, you know, you can have a whole range of flows hitting that bridge, also from a Q2 all the way to Q1000, Q2000, even in extreme events. But then you also have hydrological modeling uncertainties, um, looking at sample mean, population mean. You have hydraulic modeling uncertainties. One of the famous one is the Munnings N. I mean, there are lots of, and Xiao Fing, you showed us a little distribution on the, this morning on, on uncertainties of the um, roughness coefficient. And then equations have also uncertainties. That's where we use the bootstrapping. And then, of course, the critical shear, which James just explained. And then actually merging both, that gives us the scale exceedance probability. Um, so um, we're using that decay function method and the probabilistic analysis um, will give us a whole uh, <coughs> range of uh, decay functions using all, the, all these uncertainties. Um, and that gives us also the confidence intervals. And if we now use um, like horizontal slices through these uh, decay function curves, we get actually distributions, you know, on the little bit, um, once you get a little bit to a shallow depth, that distribution has a huge, uh, bigger standard deviation. As deeper you go, that standard deviation actually gets reduced. And that's kind of combined with the critical shear stress distribution. And if you do, this is kind of what also the LRFD concept is based on. Uh, if you now marry it kind of, you actually subtract the R minus Q, like here, then you get that little shaded curve here that's to the left of, the, of this axis. That's the exceedance probability, that integration of that curve. And, gives, and that gives you kind of 
the first exceedance probability at that um, cut, at that horizontal elevation. And you can do this for every foot as you go deeper, and you get kind of that um, exceedance probability curve um, for every uh, kind of incremental skull depth. So, um, so we did that, and um, as you can see here at that 530 elevation, um, um, since this is a, this analysis combines all the flows that automatically includes the Q100 and the Q500, um, revealed that at the 530 elevation, we have a 3.3% chance of exceedance. Um, what does that tell 3.3% chance in 75 years? Just keep in mind, if you design these days for a Q500 or a Q100, a Q100 has a 53% chance of exceedance in 75 years, and the Q500 has a 13% chance of exceedance in 75 years. And this is 3.3% in 75 years, but the scar depth. Now, in the next exercise, we wanted to see how this compares with the HEC-18 method, which uh, MDOT used for this project. So, um, there, um, okay, their deterministic um, uh, analysis revealed that the uh, total scour for the Q500 is, is 41, and, and the total PS scour for Q100 was uh, 36 feet. Um, and this is, we did a Monte Carlo, just a little, this is a little animation how Monte Carlo works. So you, you ex maybe you recognize the CSU equation here, right? But we pick Y and the fruit number as a random variable. And we have two distributions for the flow depth and the fruit number. And Monte Carlo just randomly picks um, these numbers 100,000 times, we just showed 1,000 times here, and, um, and computes the skull depth for every um, realization, and that gives us the scour distribution, as you can see here. Uh, flipping it now into a CDF um, gives us the exceedance probabilities for the uh, Q100, was here 21%, and 8.8 um, .8 for the Q500. So um, uh, this was, I think, the... Uh, now, combining this with the next scour, which was three, it's, I mean, the Q500 is still in a very similar range, but um, it's natural that we ha that the HEC-18 has more uncertainties because you know we are we don't actually the CSU equation doesn't even have any soil in there. So the refined analysis we have more information gives you more uncertainty more certainty as you can see in the 3.3. So in a summary, um, what we can say is that um, the, the Q500 and the next scour are very close in, in uncertainties and um, but. Uh, the only big difference is that the next scour resulted in a much more shallow scour depth because we determined that the clay would be resistant. Um, so that's all I have. Um, are any questions? No? Sorry. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, you yeah, have a good. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Can you speak about the, the duration with, with the Danieler too? Because scour is so duration-based. So with the erosion rates, is this assuming a steady state for the hydrology? Yes, at this point, because okay. we, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so the question was if we kind of, uh, did we incorporate any time dependency? Uh, at this point, we did not, because on the hydrological side, we just don't have that information. Once, uh, we're actually working with USGS, and I think Jared Smith should, is, should be here. They're working on, on, on slow duration curves, also for ungauge locations. Once that's then, once we have that, that could be then combined. Okay, thank you. Yeah? yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, the scar hole depends on the pier shape, and, and there are different, there's a decay functions for circular piers. Um, however, they, um, we did also for rectangle beers, but lots of the data actually starts collapsing because um, they, um, the decay is very similar, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. How was the shear stress at the bottom of the scar hole defined? Was it like a point measurement? Was it a max predicted by another one? Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, we developed a, a kind of a, a nominal shear stress method where we uh, we pick an, a, a larger area and then we rank, we rank all the shear stresses starting from the maximum 
all the way down, and then we use the projected width of the pier as the cutoff for that nominal shear. Well, when you say rank, you mean that the CFD, yeah. cells, yeah. there's multiple cells. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so we use CFD for that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, we just added this table to illustrate exceedance probabilities. Because, you know, if, if we tell you, let's say, the scour has a 3.3% chance, you don't have a good feeling what that is. But if we thought, if we tell you what you do now here, because this is what you're doing now. If you design a Q100 or Q500, you have a 14% chance of exceedance. That gives you kind of like a reference what the 3.3% means. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.